Peace be with you. We're going to begin this morning with a quote by Michael Reeves, who is a professor of theology at Union, a school of theology. He says, when all seems broken, uncertain, or wrong, remember God the unchanging, who through it all cannot be broken, uncertain, or wrong. We're just going to start, we're just going to dwell with that for a moment. When all seems broken, uncertain, or wrong, remember God the unchanging, who through it all cannot be broken, uncertain, or wrong? Are there times when things seem broken? Are there times when things seem uncertain? Are there times when things seem wrong? Yes, yes, and yes. Well, maybe during those moments we need to remember God the unchanging, who through it all cannot be broken, uncertain, or wrong. Now, just because you and I can't see how something broken can get fixed, dot, 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 just because you and I cannot see how something which is uncertain will become more certain, dot, 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 just because you and I cannot see how something that is wrong will be turned into a right, dot, 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 that doesn't mean that God can't and, and we belong to Him. And so in the first century, Jesus burst onto the scene proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And we've been talking about this as we go through the gospel of Mark, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It is where and when God rules as king. The kingdom of God is near in Christ. That's one of the things we've been talking about. Good news is proclaimed to the poor. You know, the the brokenhearted are going to be bound up. There is forgiveness and peace with God through Jesus. All of these wonderful things. And people are gathering around, but there's still a lot of questions for those people who are first following Jesus. A lot of questions, a lot of challenges, and some people were asking, wait a second, if Jesus is in fact the long-awaited Messiah, if Jesus is the Son of God, why are there so many crazy things still happening? Why is it taking so long? Why are the dreaded Romans still ruling over us? Why are we facing opposition in the political realm? Why, why, why? And so Jesus, in response, teaches a series of parables And here are two of the reasons he does so at this particular time. One, he wants to teach them about the true nature of the kingdom because some people have kind of forgotten the nature of what the kingdom of God is actually like. And second, it's to encourage disciples forward in a time when so much seems broken, uncertain, and wrong. And so what Jesus says to them then continues to be instructive for us now. And so to find more, we're going to go into the text, Mark 4, beginning at verse 21. Now, the first 20 verses of Mark are what we looked at last week called the parable of the sower, right? And the parable of the sower, and Jesus takes these illustrations from everyday life, and he teaches some greater purpose or a greater meaning about the kingdom of God. And really, in the parable of the sower, it all boiled down to verse 20, and this is the kind of soil, the receptive people that we want to be. We do three things. We hear the word. And you hear the word of God, we accept it, which means to welcome sincerely and agree with. And then we bear fruit, which is New Testament language for showing evidence of our faith, right? In acts of love and servanthood. So this really is an extension of that teaching as we go to these three shorter parables uh, today. And so here we go, beginning at verse 21. And he, Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so this is an extension of the parable of the sower. And so, whereas before he was talking about being good soil and bearing fruit, here it's about being a light. Being a light. So you don't take a light and put a basket over it. You don't light a torch and stick it in the water and snuff it out. It is meant to shine. And this is about us. So just as we are to bear fruit, we are to shine as well. And this is always a good thing to remind ourselves of in a world in which a lot of people struggle to find purpose. As we talked about last week, you are born to bless. You are here on purpose and for a purpose. If you are made in the image of God, and we all are, Genesis 1.27... The part of our job is to, is to carry forward that goodness of God in a world that is hurting. Carry forward the goodness of God in a world that is hurting. You are made to shine. Verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Okay, so a couple of things about this. Both of these statements, he says, um, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So first of all, we've heard that before. And so sometimes Jesus will use a short little statement and he'll use it in various contexts. And so he does that with that in Matthew 7, verse 2. And that combined with the statement, for the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So in the context, here's, here's what it means, because it's like, that, that doesn't make sense to us. That doesn't seem fair or something. But remember what he said about the fruit. Remember what he said about the light. Here's what it means. It means if you share and show the light of Christ, you will gain more of that light of Christ. If you don't share and show the light of Christ, even what you have will be taken away. This is the idea. It's kind of a use it or lose it kind of mentality, right? Or what does is, what is Canadian blood services uh, say? It's in you to give, right? That's the idea with the light of Christ. It's in you to give. Uh, Donald Whitney, uh, in a book on spiritual disciplines, he says this. Next slide. There is no such thing as spiritual unemployment or spiritual retirement in the kingdom of God. I really like that. There is no such thing as spiritual unemployment or spiritual retirement in the kingdom of God. God is doing good things in the world through His people. You may retire from the school board. You may retire from the electric company, but you do not retire from discipleship. You were made to shine. All right, continuing, verse 26. This is the second of three parables in today's section of text. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, verse 26, like a seed on the ground. Okay, that sounds like the parable of the sower, so these are probably connected. And then in verse 27, the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. What we're supposed to see here is the work of the kingdom of God belongs to God and not to us. So God might use us in work in the kingdom, and ultimately, he's the one who is making it grow and spread. And then it says, the earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And then here what we're supposed to see is the kingdom of God advances in stages. We don't know exactly the timing of those stages, but God does. It's His work that He's working forwards. And then He talks about the harvest coming in verse 29. So this is really about Judgment Day. And Judgment Day, when Jesus returns as, as judge and Savior, uh, and, the, and the full kingdom is revealed, uh, it's often talked about as a harvest. It's spoken of in that way in, in Revelation 14. But I think here the idea is we have to bear fruit, even though we don't understand everything about the kingdom. Even though our expectations are sometimes not met or challenged or changed, even though we are to bear light and we don't know exactly how all the kingdom of God is unraveling here on the, or unrolling here on the earth, our time is to shine is now, for one day the harvest will come. Verse 30, third parable, and he, Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed. Which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Okay, so it's a small seed. Uh, This was a very common seed that farmers in first century Judea would have used. Very small, but it would grow to six feet, ten feet, kind of a bush tree type of thing. In the spring, um, blossom would be be yellow. Um, It it would produce... um, you know, oil uh, for healing and, or for cooking and these sorts of things. So uh, that, that's kind of, visualize that in your head. Verse 32, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all of the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And so it not only provides for people, but birds, creatures are finding nests in its shade. And so the kingdom is home for people. The kingdom is home for people. Now in Ezekiel 37, sorry, Ezekiel 17 in the Old Testament, there is a tree which symbolizes uh, God's uh, peaceful reign in the world. God's peaceful reign in the world. Is Jesus making an intentional connection? It's hard to be sure. It's a beautiful image nevertheless. The point is, is that it starts small, but it ends in beautiful and glorious and incredible proportions. That's what we're being taught here. Verse 33, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. 
I like that. Jesus is compassionate as they are able to hear it. He's not speaking over their heads, right? He's not like a professor speaking to a toddler in words that a professor would use to colleagues. Like he comes down, he speaks to their level in ways that they can understand because he cares. Verse 34, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so before we went through today's text, I said that the parables really, in light of some of the confusion or challenge people were experiencing, uh, the text, I think, uh, does at least two things. First of all, it clarifies the true nature of the kingdom because people were misunderstanding what the kingdom of God was and how it is uh, to be revealed in the world. And second, it encourages the disciples forward when things seem broken, uncertain, or wrong. And I said that what was instructive to them then is also instructive to us Now, here's three points. First, you are a light which is intended to shine. This is connected to the point last week, but we cannot miss it because Jesus makes this point over and over. And and how do we know this? Well, it's told to us directly in verse 21. You are not to be put under a basket, right? You are made on purpose and for a purpose. You were born to bless. As someone who is made in the image of God, you carry forward the goodness of God in a world that is hurting. Even when things seem broken, uncertain, or wrong, you are a light which is intended to shine. Even when you personally get frustrated that things are not coming together, they're not playing out as you envisioned, that doesn't change your job description. You are a light which is intended to shine. Rebecca McLaughlin says this in a book of hers called No Greater Love. We're not called to blend in or to check out, but to shine. I like that. We're not called to blend in, which means we don't just go along with the majority. We don't just go with the flow. And we're also not called to check out, means throw our hands up in the air or just become apathetic. We could also add another category. We're not called to only shine if and when we know absolutely everything about the timing of God's kingdom. No, we are called to shine. But the world, Matthew, sometimes just feels like it's falling apart. Yeah, and you are called to shine. But the people around me get so frustrating. Yeah. And you are a light which is intended to shine. But there's so much uncertain about the future. I'm just not sure. Yeah. Join the club. You are a light which is intended to shine. Number two, God's kingdom advances according to his timing, not yours. And we learn this from verse 27. The seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. She knows not how. There is so much about God's will being revealed and and manifesting in the world that is just simply beyond our comprehension in terms of timing. Now, the Lego organization, you know Lego, the little building blocks that you make? I was going to say for kids, but people of all ages love Lego. It's amazing. You put it out, everyone loves loves to play with Lego. Anyway, their organizations ask this question. They say, how many possible combinations, building combinations, are there with just six standard Lego building blocks? And they say, is it 36? Is it 128? Is it 128,000? Is it over 9 million? Well, according to the mathematicians over at Lego, it's over 9 million. All the different combinations, like, that's crazy. I, I can't even imagine that. Now, here's the connection. God is moving forward His kingdom according to stages in ways that are fitting with his wisdom and his sovereignty. If there are over 9 million building block combinations from just six standard Lego pieces, how many more possibilities exist for God moving forward his revolutionary kingdom according to his wisdom here on earth? See, our perspective is limited, but God's is not. And so part of our job is to trust God and to trust the process as he brings it into fruition in the world, even when you and I can't see how all the little pieces fit together. Third, God's kingdom starts small but ends gloriously. And this is the point of the parable of the mustard seed, okay? It begins with this tiny seed but grows into something great. And so part of the word for us is patience. Now, a friend of mine saw something on a fridge magnet, so I wanted to share it with you. Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in the seed. Ever heard that before? 
Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in the seed. So yesterday, one of the kids had an apple, and so I grabbed one of the seeds. Here's an apple seed. You know how tiny it is. And I thought, yeah, you think about it. The, the idea is like, if I, if I plant this in the right conditions, it will grow up and it'll turn into an apple tree, and then it will have a bunch of apples, and they will have a bunch of seeds, and they will fall to the ground, and they will grow. And so, and so theoretically, this could be like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of apples. So in this tiny seed, there is enough potential and information for thousands and thousands of apples. And so it is with the kingdom of God, right? There are times when we feel discouraged because we see a lack of progress. Things aren't moving as we think they should and we see this last lack of progress, but God's kingdom works in ways that are often beyond what we expect. And so you and I are called to trust the process that in the end it will be on earth as it is in heaven and that God has used our faithfulness in that process. And so with these three, three things in mind, what do we distill it all down to? We need to trust God and leave the results to Him. Trust God and leave the results to Him. Would you say that with me? Trust God and leave the results to Him. Let's say it again. Trust God and leave the results to Him. See, in Jesus' time, people were struggling and they had questions and they had a misunderstanding about the nature of God's kingdom and how it was supposed to unroll and unravel in their lives and in the world, but they are called to follow Jesus, to get in on the work that He invites them to do in the world, even when things are playing out, not how they envisioned, and to leave their results to God. And that's the same thing for us. We today, we are being called as disciples in this modern era to follow Jesus, to get in engaged in, in the work that He is doing, even when we can't see how everything fits together because we are not God, and to leave the results to Him. In a church in Oklahoma, there was a guy, it was a church service on a Sunday morning just like this, and he was there, but he felt really strongly prompted by the Holy Spirit to open his wallet and give all the money that was in there to this lady in the next pew. And I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of a strange thing. I'm not going to have any money in my wallet after that. But, you know, he'd been thinking and reflecting upon what, you know, he thought God was calling him to do. And, and so he had this strong, maybe this is from the Holy Spirit. So he does it. He t- gives the money and gives it to her. And that's when he learned a little bit more about her story, that she was going through a difficult time in her life. And that very morning, she was thinking, oh, I don't know um, if I should go to church. I, I don't have enough money to get back. And she felt strongly prompted by God, you just need to be there. You just need to go. And so she trusted God that all the money she had was enough to get to church. She didn't have enough money for lunch afterwards. She didn't have enough money for a taxi home. But there in that moment, God answered that prayer in a very practical way. And so the man trusted God and left the results to him. And the woman trusted God and left the results to him. This is so often what we need to do as we walk into the mystery of God's kingdom. And so with that in mind, think about the challenges that you specifically are facing. Some of you are worrying a lot about the future. I know you. I know it's true. Some of you are dealing with a kind of exhaustion in your soul, and you're not sure how to ever get back to that place of refreshment. Some of you are dealing with uncertain health issues, and that's really hard. Some of you are dealing with family dynamics, which are particularly painful Some of you are trying to create a new chapter in your life almost from scratch. Some of you are trying to do Jesus' work in a world that you feel is against you. Or whatever it is, the best thing that you can do for tomorrow is to trust God today. The best thing you can do for tomorrow is to trust God today. Why? Because when things aren't playing out as we envision, when things aren't happening and we're not seeing the results that we think that we should see. What happens is we start to doubt what we are doing today. Well, maybe following Jesus isn't what I need to do. Maybe those teachings are too hard. Maybe they're too distinct. Maybe I don't want to be different. Maybe I can't trust that. And what happens is we start veering off course, but trusting Jesus today is always the best thing that we can do for tomorrow, not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones. Going a divergent path always ends up being worse for everybody. 
The best thing that you can do for tomorrow is to trust God today. So the job today is to live by faith, and the job tomorrow is to live by faith, and the job the day after that is to live by faith. And the God who guides and provides will lead us as He always does. Let's end with that quote with which we began. When all seems broken, uncertain, or wrong, remember God the unchanging who through it all cannot be broken, uncertain, or wrong. Are there times when things seem broken? Are there times when things seem uncertain? Are there times when things seem wrong? Yes, yes, yes. Well, maybe those are the moments when we need to remember God the unchanging who, through it all, cannot be broken, uncertain, or wrong. Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket? To the one who has, more will be given. The seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed. Friends, trust God and leave the results to Him. Amen.